You're welcome to send me questions. I do have a fair number of questions from uh, that have been sent to me. A week from today is July 8th. And so I'll be doing the video chat that week. The Thursday after that, two days later, July 10, will be the first Thursday video chat that will be run by a coach. And that'll be just a hoot. So we're going to be doing those from now on. Every Thursday there will be a video, a video chat run by a coach uh, or a coaching student, initially by more experienced coaches, and then eventually we're going to bring in the coaching students. So that should be a lot of fun. And that'll be done every Thursday, um, so starting in a week. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Those will be archived also, just like these are. So you, if you miss them, you can uh, come back and catch those. And I want to announce again, as we will halfway through this, Don is going to remind me that uh, we've got the parenting seminar coming up August 2nd and 3rd. Don't miss it. It's uh, going to be very effective. There will be a great deal of content discussed uh, on that as well as the usual working with uh, people's scenarios. Uh, that will be happening in Phoenix. Uh, August is going to be a hot time to be in Phoenix, literally. Uh, but in this case, it's uh, going to be a very effective time to, to discuss uh, parenting issues which of course translate to uh, workplace, leadership of all kinds, uh, because anybody who's nurturing and teaching people becomes a parent to that person. Uh, if you're a wise man or woman, uh, which all of us are, as soon as we talk or have an opportunity to be, as soon as we talk to another human being, then we're a parent. Uh, gosh, we all have the opportunity to function as parents to people uh, on more occasions during a day than most of us realize. In fact, most of us really slide by those opportunities and fail to be parents to those around us. So it would be a good opportunity for uh, many of us to be taught how to be parents. And we have people coming from all over for that. Um, Here's somebody who, said, who sent me uh, a note and said uh, something I thought was very interesting. Uh, he said, I just want you to know that I've gotten real help from Real Love in the Workplace and I've recently used it to lead a church staff retreat um, for uh, a congregation um, down in Florida. Uh, the whole staff of the church was there. And the feedback that I got uh, from the pastor has been very positive. He tells me that his staff now is using the language of real love. He made sure before the retreat that each staff member got a copy of Real Love in the Workplace. Uh, he said, thanks uh, for that practical book with my involvement in real love for the last three years. This is the person who's sending me the, uh, the letter. Uh, I was able to lead a retreat based on your book and bring some good guidance to a church staff that wants to grow in love and peace. Uh, real love in the workplace is just very useful. Uh, every single person that walks into uh, a workplace, either employee, the supervisors, the owner, the vendors, uh, the, the technicians that, that walk through, the consultants, uh, the customers, every person is a human being who walks in with a need to feel unconditionally loved. and. If we recognize that, we will hugely optimize our interactions with them, which obviously optimizes our communication, cooperation, uh, creativity, and in the end, uh, productivity and profitability. If we don't recognize the need that all of these different people in the workplace have to feel unconditionally accepted, we're going to become absolutely mired in a mess of emptiness and fear and getting and protecting behaviors. Uh, we've all had the experiences at work of people who attack us, people who lie, people who protect themselves by acting like victims. And they can bring a workplace to an absolute standstill. You have any doubt about whether emptiness and fear can affect productivity, run into one of these people. And we all run into these people. 
most of us run into these people every day to varying degrees with their little snotty tones, with their little looks in the workplace, with their kind of holding back in the way that they uh, interact with us in getting a project done, with the little things that they say in meetings. They cause just incalculable damage to the people around them and to their companies because of the unrecognized emptiness and fear that they carry with them into the workplace. Uh, here's somebody who says, uh, my seven-year-old threw a tantrum today when I changed the channel on TV. I, uh, oh, this, this was at the end of last time and I didn't, didn't read it before I came, here to, uh, before I came to this. Uh, my husband let this happen and let the tantrum happen, I assume, and got on to me because I yelled at my son for throwing a fit. When we finally got him to go to his room, after going through many threats of punishment, me, my husband, and mother had a discussion about being a united front. Then my son came back in and asked what army is going to stop him. <laughs> and me and my mom said, we don't need an army. We're together. My husband, when prompted, didn't say anything and tried to leave the house. My husband basically gave up, and when my mother tried to get my son to take a bath, he ran from her and ran outside. My husband thought he would intervene, and he went outside and had a long talk with him and was able to bring him back inside and get him to take a bath. This was very undermining to my mother. My mother and husband are both upset about the situation. How do I handle this better? It's a little confusing. My husband gave up when my mother tried to get my son to take a bath. I see, and he went out, ran from her, and went outside. My husband thought he would intervene, went outside, had a long talk with him, was able to bring him back in. Yeah, when, when there are two or three people involved in trying to get a child to do a thing, you get your mother, your husband, and they don't agree. It is very confusing to a kid. Um, like, uh, the kid obviously is going to pick which of the three of you is going to do the thing in the way that he wants to get it done, which of course makes the world very confusing for this child because you set a rule and then the kid just picks whatever parent or whatever adult lets him get away with whatever he wants to do. Well, now imagine how this kid anticipates that the world is going to get like, be like as he gets older. When a teacher, for example, says, you have to do this. And then, then the child is thinking, no, I don't. I can do anything I want to because at home I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is fuss and kick and scream and look for somebody who's going to let me get away with whatever I want to do. So you're doing the kid a huge disservice. Uh, by, by having one of the three of you not cooperating. So in a given situation, when you have an adult who's a coward and you know, walks outside and doesn't you know, stand with the united front, it is very undermining. And in that particular situation, you're kind of screwed. You, you can't really you know, discipline the undermining adult, but you can get together with the three of you and say, uh, so how do you think that went? Uh, we just had a difficult you know, interaction with um, Billy, whatever the child's name is. Um, the bottom line is, did Billy f learn a good principle that's going to help Billy grow up to be the two things that you want a child to be, which is loving and responsible? That's the thing you always have to be asking. You don't get together with, like, yours is a little more complicated because you actually have a mother at home. Let's just say it's just the two of you. You don't get together with the, the, your screw-up spouse and say, okay, you didn't do what we agreed to do. Spouses really don't like to hear that, uh, so I really strongly recommend you don't do that with your spouse. Don't get together with them and say, now, we agreed to do this and you didn't do it. Um, people don't like to be told they're wrong. So wait till the end of the day. Don't do it immediately after they screw up. Give them a chance to breathe, and say, "All right, you know, earlier today we had an interaction with Billy. Um, 
how do you think it went? Give them a chance first to say, well, it didn't go very well. Because if you give them a chance to say, well, it didn't go very well, the whole rest of the conversation is going to go pretty easily, isn't it? Rather than you shoving it down their throat. Uh, if they say, well, you know, I'm not really sure how it went. Then you ask the question, well, you know, did the, did, did the interaction go in such a way that Billy learned to be responsible and loving? All of this is way easier if the two of you have read Real Love and Parenting. But it's pretty obvious that if the child didn't take a bath <coughs> and ran out of the house screaming, that wouldn't qualify as loving and responsible. So then you talk about, so how could we do this differently? Then, using the principles of the book, you talk about how the two of you could do it. Now let's say that one of you is like a complete coward about, for example, consistently applying consequences. If one of you, until that person gets up to speed, let's say your husband's a complete coward. He may not be, but let's just say your husband is. If one of you is a complete coward, instead of saying, okay, we have to be a united front, sometimes one parent cannot be a united front. All right, well, then it's silly to ask that parent to be the same as the other parent. Just as silly as it is to say, for example, ask both husband and wife to be equally yoked in repairing the car. You get this? So if both of you can't do a thing equally, then you can always do this. You can say, um, well then, when it comes to when Billy screams about taking his bath, how about if we do this? I'll be in charge of seeing to it that Billy takes his bath. Would you be okay with that? Sure, says the parent, you know, who, who is like clueless about how to get Billy to take his bath. Then you say, then all I ask is that when Billy throws a fit about his bath, all you have to do is not speak and not interfere. Would you be willing to do that and I'll take care of it? Usually the gutless parent will then say, oh, sure, they're relieved. They're relieved to be out of it. So that's one way to do it. Um, and you know there are other ways, but that's just a suggestion. So you just need to be talking about it all the time, constantly refining, constant feedback, always working for what's best for the child and never you know jumping on somebody who screws up it's always about the kid what can we do to improve things for the child and it's amazing how cool you can become as parents when you focus on what's better for the kid Here's somebody who says, uh, I swore I wouldn't get angry again with a coworker who attacks in just about every exchange, and I failed again. Uh, I did manage to tell her that we were not going to have the same conversation again on an issue that has been discussed before, and it went downhill for me from there. She always says, don't get angry with, gates, with great satisfaction, I might add. Uh, I do have a big ring in my nose. I see it. I feel like an idiot each time she jerks it and I respond. So it's pretty obvious that this person sees that she can easily tweak you and get you angry. Look even what you said. You said, I swore I wouldn't get angry again. Um, and I did manage to tell her that we were not going to have the same conversation again. Now, without meaning to, as soon as you say, we are not going to have the same conversation again, um, what you're doing is you're controlling her. You're saying, we are not going to have the same conversation. You're controlling her. You're trying to get the conversation over. So what if you did an entirely different thing? instead of trying to get the conversation to end so you can get her out of your sight, which is what it sounds like when you say, we're not going to have the same conversation, you're not really listening. 
What if you said to her, um, I understand entirely what you're saying. What if you said to her, what you're telling me is one, two, three, and four. What if you were able to repeat back to her in a clear, concise way exactly the points that she's been trying to make to you over and over again? Most people repeat themselves to you because you're not genuinely listening. Most of the time when people come at you and at you, it's because they say, I want this. And then you come back with, but you can't have that because. So they say this and you say but. And then they say this and you say but. And they say C and you say but. And they say D and you say but. And they say E and you say but. I can tell you, people don't keep having the same conversations <coughs> when they come at you and they say two, four, six, and then you say, oh, I understand what you're saying now. Not only two, four, six, but eight, ten, twelve. I see completely what you're saying. I understand entirely. Um, I can see the benefits of your argument. I can see where it would go. I can see how it would benefit things. Um, you know. I'll look more thoroughly at what you're saying. We might be able to implement some of what you're saying. We may not be able to do some of those things. In fact, we may not be able to do any of them. But I'll think about it more clearly. Uh, I'll come back to you. The answer may still be no, but I have failed to listen to you in the past. So let me more clearly say, state what you said. Let me do it again. Two, four, six, eight. 10, let me supply another couple of examples. Do you think I clearly understand the points you're making now? People rarely keep pounding you with the same argument unless they're certain you haven't been listening. So try really listening to her. Then if she comes at you again, you say it again. But, but what you do is when she comes at you and she says, well now I, you say, so, so let me just stop you. Do I understand your argument? One, two, three. Do I get it? And she says, well, yes. Then you say, then there's no reason to go over it again, is there? I understand you. And the answer is still the same. That takes 30 seconds rather than the usual irritation. But you first have to really demonstrate real listening. And usually we haven't. <clears throat> Here's somebody who says, uh, I've been attending real love meetings since May. I first met my wife in the fall of 2002, and then nine months later, I moved in with her. Um, she'd always been an occasional pot smoker, which had bothered me, but after a few months, it suddenly just blew a switch in me and irritated me a lot. I told her she needed to choose me or the pot. Uh, apparently by this time, ah, uh, here we are. She said she would choose me, but then she smoked pot the next day. I became a complete victim about it and focused on the pot to the point that I started losing income in my job. It was apparently really bothering him. But then the issue would get brushed under the rug and we'd move on. We got married two years later. So it's a big issue to him, but he got married anyway to her. About two months later, I knew she was going to hang out with her pot-smoking girlfriend, so I chose to tell her the truth, that I had let her smoking bother me a lot, but that I realized it was not against me, and if it were going to be just a couple of times a year, I'd accept it. She assured me it was only once or twice a year, and then two weeks later, she brought home a bag and smoked it like four to five times a week for three months. More victim behavior by me, and I didn't know what was the truth at all at that point. Then we opened an office where we worked together. This guy's like a professional guy and, and hired her. It was more expensive than my previous office, so the money that I'd been contributing to the household was now diverted to the office. Now remember, he's living with her. I continued to struggle financially and had anger toward the betrayal of trust about the smoking. I felt I was supposed to learn a lesson from this and did the best I could. Well, now she's asked me to move out. Um, Due to the lack of financial contribution, no, she, she asked me to move out May 3rd, so that was, you know, like a month ago, two months ago. Uh, due to the lack of financial contribution mostly, and also what I know now as getting and protecting behaviors. I had little choice but to move in with my parents because of money trouble. 
She said living with me was causing her stomach knots, anxiety, and lack of sleep. A week after I moved out, having read your first, first book and going to the group, I was excited to see her and share what I'd learned and how I was learning to love unconditionally. It was easy to see that there was still love inside her. She thought it was gone. We had a great time. Three days later, we spent the day together, and it was great. Um, we've had three little upsets in the past seven weeks, the biggest from a counseling session where I admitted as a wise friend and real love suggestion suggested that I had been a lousy husband, that I hadn't been unconditionally loving, that I was learning how to do that and wanted to build a successful marriage with her. The counselor told me uh, that I sounded like I had low self-esteem. <laughs> Pause here. When, when people in real love talk about the fact that they've been like lousy at loving, that they've been terrible husbands or terrible parents, it's pretty common that, that therapists have not heard that kind of language before. And so they'll call that low self-esteem. So if you refer to something that you did as stupid or as being a lousy husband, they'll stop you and say, oh, oh, don't say that. Because remember, therapists' whole careers are built on manipulating and trading and lying. So they don't even know what to do with truth-telling. So here's an example. The counselor tells him he has tells him he has low self-esteem when he's really just telling the truth. That's a scream. So back to, what he, back to his note. So now she's content living separately. His wife uh, considers us to be dating, despite the fact that we've been married for two and a half years, and I'm not happy living in my parents' trailer. Her condition for me is to contribute close to her condition for moving back in. He didn't explain that, but that's what he means is to contribute close to a half of the household expenses before moving back in. She wants to get back together when that happens, but she's content to be dating at this point. She's read your first book too, but she's not as willing to learn it as I am. I've spent a handful of nights back at her house, and about one out of three times we see each other, we have sex. I'm obviously uh, struggling trying to find the line between imitation love and real love in this mess. I feel like we do have a lot of love underlying all of our getting and protecting behaviors, but maybe it's mostly imitation love. We're certainly not doing any physical abuse or screaming or yelling. As I've told my real love wise man friend, I'm trying to stay in my half of the relationship and work on me. I still get in clingy, victim, and attacking behaviors based on wanting to be with her, back in the house, uh, back in our bed, and other comfortable surroundings. My wise man friend wanted me to ask you, because of everything that's going on, what would be a good next step for us? I'm eager to hear your advice. He seems to think that our being sexual may be clouding the real love work. Um, all right, so it's pretty obvious that your relationship was based on imitation love from the start. I mean, almost everybody's it. Um, so what do you do now? The thing is to spend as much time as you can around people who are familiar with real love. Why? So that you can tell the truth about yourself, so that you can f get as filled up as possible with real love, so that you can bring that back to your wife. The real reason she threw you out wasn't just because you weren't contributing half of the household expenses. It's because she doesn't feel loved by you. If this woman really felt unconditionally loved by you and you were contributing less than half the household expenses, do you think she would have thrown you out? Oh, please. She would not. She's using that as one of who knows how many excuses. But that's not the real reason. It's about love. It really is. So you need to share this with your wife, what you're learning, but not just the principles you're learning. Like you said, she's read the book. You need to share this with her in the way you behave, with how loving you are to her, not pushing her to move back in, but simply being more accepting and kind toward her. So tell her that loving is your primary goal, and that nagging her about anything is unproductive. So I get it that it bothers you that she smokes pot. And I agree that smoking pot is not helpful to any relationship. Anything that alters your brain is 
not going to help you function better in a loving relationship. It's not. So, you know, eventually, at some point, as you two are feeling closer, you know, you might describe to her why it bothers you that she smokes pot. It affects love in a relationship. It does. She can't feel love as well when she's under the influence of pot. I mean, it's scary if, if she's found in the possession of pot while she's in her house, she can lose her house. They are frighteningly inflexible these days when they find people in possession of illegal substances. They take their house, their car, and you're screwed. So there are bad risks, legal risks, um, it affects your relationship, it's terrible. So just tell her it frightens you. But nagging her after you've said that once, there's no reason to nag her. Once she knows it, you're done. And I wouldn't tell her that early on. I'd wait. Uh, the thing you need in your relationship right now is her feeling loved. Then at some point suggest that your relationship is more important to you than anything, including the money. That being together is more important than anything else. So that's the thing to focus on. Now, sex, can sex be a huge form of imitation love? Yes. Um, would I avoid sex in your situation? No. I wouldn't. You two are married. Uh, it's not like you're on your second date. Um, and in your case, sex can actually be a way to potentially bring you two closer together. Like you've described, when you two do get together, you have sex one in three times. It's not like you two are acting like um, two diseased rabbits. Um, it's not like the center focus of your relationship. It's not like you pursue sex to the exclusion of everything else. If you told me that you were pursuing sex on the internet, you know, constantly, and that all you thought about was having sex with her, and sex was the focus, the center point of your life, then maybe, but it's not. So, no, I wouldn't avoid sex with her. Now, those of you who are watching, um, after this man wrote me this letter and after I had you know considered how I'd respond to him which I just did um, I got a note like today from him and he said this he said my wife has decided that because of the way I have changed my behavior toward her because of real love, because I'm more tolerant, because of the time that I've been spending with this wise man, because of the time I've been spending going to group, because of how I've become more loving toward her, he said um, that I don't have to make more money. I don't have to get a different job before moving back in. Although our relationship isn't entirely based on real love yet, um, I've been present to the principles as much as I can, especially when filled up, of course, that, um, let's see, so anyway, so he says that he knows that what he's learned about real love and how he's changed is helping. Um, so far, we haven't set a date for me to move back in, but I've opened the dialogue about knowing what we want from the relationship. So he's just recognizing that what he's learned and how he's changed uh, has made a difference. And it really does. So, way to go. Big difference. In just this one man's life, and it's only been two months. And even though his wife isn't entirely on board, here's, here's a nice answer to the question people say to me sometimes, well, so what if I learn a lot about real love, but my spouse doesn't want to? Well, who cares? Uh, you learn about real love, you bring it back to your relationship, and your relationship will change. And it will change because you're different. It has to. I had an interesting conversation the other day with a woman, and I wrote down just a little bit of it, just a small section of it, just to share with you. Um, she 
she asked me why she's still miserable. Uh, she's been studying real love for a little while, and, and I told her, because you're still trying to earn love. You're still trying to buy it. And she said, how can you know that? And I said, whenever we talk, uh, and I, I haven't talked to her very many times, I said, you hang your head, you stumble, you become nervous, you're afraid of not saying the right thing. I said, is that, is that accurate? Uh, am I not describing who you are? She said, uh, no, that, that's true, I still do that. I said, those are all signs of trying to earn imitation love. She said, I hadn't really thought of that. I said, you're trying to look good so that I will like you. She said, I guess that's true. So I said, so why do you keep doing that? See, people who are shy and who don't say much don't think of themselves as buying love, but they are. They're constantly buying love too, buying imitation love in the form of safety. They're just because they're not so obvious, so obvious in the way that they're buying it by doing things to earn it, they're they're busy not doing things so that they won't lose it. It's the same thing. And I said, so why do you keep doing that? Why, why do you keep hanging your head and avoiding doing the wrong things? And she said, I don't know. I said, because you believe you're worthless. She said, yeah, I do. Why do you think you're worthless? She said, I don't know. And I said, because other people have taught you that you're worthless thousands of people from the time you were a little kid to the present day and they were wrong. Now the real question is when I tell you that they were wrong all those thousands of people why would you believe me that I tell you that you're not worthless and not believe them when they tell you with their words and behavior that you are worthless? Why would the opinion of one person, me, outweigh the opinion of thousands of people who tell you that you are worthless. She said, I don't know. Because it appears that their opinion would be more worthwhile. Thou a thousand to one. It would seem that they'd be more right. But they're not. And the answer is pretty easy. All of those, we'll call it a thousand people, it's actually more than a thousand people that had told her she was worthless. All those thousand people wanted something from you. All those thousand people called you worthless because you didn't give them what they wanted. So their opinion wasn't pure, was it? You can't count on their opinion as the truth. It was simply a reflection of what they wanted. So you can't call it the truth. When somebody calls you worthless because you don't give them what they want, that's not the truth. So if you have a candy bar, for example, and somebody says, give it to me, and you don't give it to them, and they say, you're stupid, mean, ugly, and worthless, um, you'd have to call their opinion worthless, wouldn't, it? wouldn't you? You wouldn't say that them calling you stupid, mean, ugly, and worthless was true. No, it's based entirely on what they wanted. And the same is true with all these people in this woman's life calling this woman worthless with their sighs and with their you know, mean-spirited looks and with their facial expressions. They had convinced her she was worthless because she wasn't giving them what they wanted. And I said, I don't want anything from you. And you are far from worthless. So if one person who doesn't need you and who can see you clearly says you are infinitely worthwhile, you might want to listen to that person. Here's somebody who says my <clears throat> husband's friend is becoming very close to a mutual female friend of, of theirs. He does things with his friend like taking their kids to the zoo uh, without consulting my friend. And he talks to this woman several times a week on the phone. He says that it's always about the kids or recreation stuff that he and she are involved in. 
when she, when my friend, asked him to discuss things with her before he makes pl plans with this other lady, he said no. So here, here we have this woman whose husband is doing things with a second lady and always helping her and helping her children and going out with her and things like that. And when the woman says, well, I would appreciate you letting me know when you're going to do things. And he says, no. So he's keeping secrets from his wife about what he does with another woman. This is not good. Um, he said that he was doing this for the kids. Well, <laughs> you can see how this makes no sense whatever. I mean, if I'm doing something for some other woman's kids, which I've done on many occasions, or for another woman, which I've done on many occasions, many of, many of you who are watching, um, and Donna says, well, tell me what you're doing, which she would rarely have to do because I would already have told her. Um, the only reason I would tell her no is if something secretive is going on. I would only keep a secret if there's something odd about what I'm doing, something I'm ashamed of, something, or not necessarily, there may not be something that I'm ashamed of. The other possible reason would be if I wanted to punish her, to hurt her, to keep her out of my life, which is just as bad a reason. Uh, he said he was doing this for the kids and that he thought it would be insulting to Paula to say that he had to run it by his wife. Um, that would be yet another reason and still a horrible reason because when you're married to somebody, the two of you are one. And I hear this from men all the time. Anytime any of you call me, uh, and say, Greg, would you blank anything that requires my time? Uh, you'll hear me give you this answer routinely. Well, you know, that's a possibility. We might do that. Um, I'll check with Donna. And you might think, you know, what's a big six foot one, 200 plus pound guy saying, I have to check with my wife? Well, let me tell you, in all the years that I've said that, I've never had another guy say, oh, you have to check with your little wifey, do you? Not when you say it with confidence, you don't. And if somebody did, um, I would simply come back with, you mean you don't check with your wife? <laughs> How could you not? Uh, my wife and I are partners. It would be exactly like if you said to, so, let's say that two people owned a business together. And I said to that person, so <clears throat> would you be, let's say that they owned a car business together. And I said, would you be willing to sell me half the cars in your business? Um, if two people own the car business together, can you imagine one of them making an agreement to sell out half of their inventory without saying, you know, that sounds like a really good idea. Let me run that by my partner first, however. Of course they would. They wouldn't make an agreement that affected their business in a huge way without checking with their business partner. Well, that works with your emotional and spiritual partner too. Duh. Uh, there's nothing demeaning about it. There's nothing insulting about it. It's just kind of obvious, really. <coughs> so he and this lady, this man and this other woman, spend enough time together that, together that when he and his wife went to Starbucks for coffee, the woman, beh woman behind the counter automatically offered his regular order, which is the other woman's preference. So you could see why this would bother his wife. My friend has shut down her efforts to communicate with him. <coughs> uh, I told her that I told her to say this. Um, we'll call him Fred. Fred, when you go out with um, this other woman without consulting me or even being willing to consult me, I feel hurt. I feel like you're being emotionally unfaithful to me. I'm not asking you to stop this. I'm letting you know what it feels like to me. If you should decide to continue as you are, I want you to know that I'm not sure how long I can continue in this marriage. 
I've realized recently that I've not been as loving toward you as I could have been. I've made lots of mistakes. I've been selfish and controlling and not contributed to your genuine happiness. I'm working on changing this because I want to learn to love you unconditionally. Now, notice, that whole thing is beautiful, um, except for one phrase. Um, she said, I'm, I want to learn to love you unconditionally. I have not been very un unconditionally loving to you up to this point. I've made lots of mistakes. Notice she says, I'm not trying to control you. Um, I'm not stopping you. Um, I'm just letting you know that it feels, that I feel like it's being unfaithful to me when you do this. Uh, the part I would leave out is, if you continue doing, it, doing this, I'm not sure how long I could continue in this marriage. Um, you know, after you expressed your willingness to learn to unconditionally love him, and you did that, you know, on and on for a long time, you know, many months, um, a year maybe, and then he continued to see the other woman, then you might throw in that part. But I wouldn't do that in my first discussion with him because that comes across really a whole lot like kind of an ultimatum. Uh, but all the rest of it, pretty good. Um, you, you really can't control your partner. You can't. But you can say when you go off with this other woman, uh, I feel alone. Uh, that's the effect that it has. Uh, it feels as though our agreement to be faithful to each other is not being kept. So you can do that, but that's the feeling that I get. Which is the, the same thing that I suggest to people, for example, who have a partner who uh, is using pornography, for example. You say, I don't feel, I don't feel honored. Uh, I don't feel like the agreement that we made for you to be sexually faithful to me is being kept. Uh, I won't stop you, uh, but I want you to know that that's how I feel. If you have any questions that you want to send in live, let me know. <coughs> Because I think we're going to have a little bit of time left over for that. Pretty sure we will, in fact. Here's somebody uh, who writes from across the ocean, <coughs> the Pacific Ocean, in fact. I learned that I had a habit to control. I attempted to control the things around me so that I would feel safer. and. We forget that about people who are controllers. When we see people controlling us, we tend to see them as perpetrators, as monsters. When we see them controlling us, we tend to recoil and blame them. But people who are controllers are really just looking for safety. That's what people who are obsessive compulsive are looking for, is safety. They are obsessive control compulsive. They control everything around them. They keep everything absolutely neat and orderly and control everything because if anything is out of place, it could upset their world. It might hurt them. And that's what controllers do. They control everybody because if everything is in their grasp, then they can't be hurt. And they get a little feeling of power in addition. So she's saying, I, attempt, I attempted to control the things around me so that I would feel safer. I tried to control my marriage too. I thought I had, now ironically, this particular woman, uh, her biggest beef in life is her husband, who is an angry, controlling man. And she tends to respond by controlling him. <coughs> I thought I had the least expectation about my marriage, that is, wishing my husband wouldn't be angry so much, but in fact, that was very controlling too. So here she identifies that. Which is understandable. We think, well, well but, but I'm not really controlling him, uh, and I've heard this many times, I'm not really controlling him, I just wish that he wouldn't attack me. See? See how how easily we could justify that? 
I'm not controlling him, but I just I wish he would stop criticizing me. But that is controlling. When somebody criticizes and attacks me, um, I then have infinite choices. I can be loving in response. Uh, I can always choose to leave the conversation. I can leave the room. Um, I have many choices. But controlling their anger isn't one of my choices. Recently, I phoned or uh, talked on Skype, which is a, another way of phoning, with real love people to tell the truth about myself more, and I have been feeling the difference. Now I try to take steps to drop the controlling habit and instead just let things happen. <coughs> However, I find myself experiencing very strong desires, wanting to go back to my old way of doing, to cling, even to plead for affection, just so that maybe I can influence the outcome, which is controlling again. See, clinging is another form of controlling. Uh, I try to resist that urge, but this is very hard for me. What else can I do? Um, you're, you're doing great. Uh, you just need to do it more. So you call people, you tell them what you're doing, describe how you controlled that day, describe how you controlled that week. Let the, the unconditional acceptance of people just infuse you. You need more and more of it. Talk to them by phone, talk to them by Skype. Um, the, um, the real love books are all being, 10 of them are being translated into your native language uh, as we speak. And then begin to share that with the people around you. And begin to create the bigger and bigger as possible real love network. And th the more loved you feel, the less you'll do it. Then go out of your way, bit by bit, read in the Real Love and Marriage book. And there's a whole section in there. It's a pretty big section, something like 20 pages or something, um, that talks about loving acts. See, it's one thing to feel loved and to be less controlling. But that's like, that's like getting to neutral. That's like going from reverse, which is what you've been living in, that's like getting to neutral. You want to actually go forward. There's a whole section in there where you can read about loving things to do. So you don't want to just stop going backward. You don't want to just get to neutral. You want to move forward. So read about the loving things you can do with your husband to actually express to him that you care about him. Read about the nice things you can do, the touching, the looking, the talking, the serving, the he'll notice that. He's really not a monster. He's really just a frightened kid. Be affectionate with him. Um, there's a whole section that will tell you things that you can do with him. And you'll see a difference in him. I was working with a couple recently that just seemed to live constantly on the field of death. Just It, it never ended. And I spent a fair bit of time with them and they kept saying, but it'll never change. But, but, but he'll never be different. And she'll never be different. And yeah, I know, I know, I know. It seems like it. Just do these things, I said. They knew the principles. Just do these things. So they started to do these things. They started to have these meetings that I was suggesting. They started to say these things to each other. They started to say the simplest truths to each other. They didn't even know how to tell the truth. Really. They didn't even know how to begin to tell the truth. They didn't even know how to say, here's how I was wrong. Here's what I have done. Here's what I have said to you that's been hurtful. Here's what... They didn't know how to start that. So I worked with them and actually helped them to write them down. And so they actually practiced starting saying those things to each other. And in a relatively very short period of time, they started to experience some loving moments. But you have to start doing them, and you have to do them regularly. You can't do loving things for your partner once every other week 
and expect to see some kind of constructive change happen in your relationship. It just doesn't work that way. It's kind of like staying on your diet once a week or working out once a week. You just as well not bother uh, because it's not going to make a difference. So go at it. Um, go at it with him. He doesn't have to read the book. You do. And implement the principles and tell him the truth and do the loving things and you will see a difference. You really will. <clears throat> Here's somebody who says, I was looking through the <clears throat> Real Love for Wise Men and Women book, but I couldn't find anything on addressing people who are clingers. My mistake. Um, should have made it easier to find, or I didn't put it in there. Who knows which? Could you talk about things that are particularly good to do when giving up um, getting and protecting behaviors for clingers? Uh, it helped me to look at my own clinging behaviors, which of course helps me to identify them in others. Uh, just so you know, I definitely cling to my children and want their approval and love. I cling at work, too. I'm afraid of being criticized and looking stupid, which, of course, I am. Yeah, it's good for you. Um, all right. One of the most useful things for people to understand as clingers, one of the most useful exercises is, um, is to see that they do it. And to see that clinging is any behavior that attempts to manipulate other people for imitation love where other people wouldn't voluntarily give it to them. And when I, I mean any kind of imitation love, any kind of attention, any kind of sympathy, any kind of praise, power, pleasure, anything. So clingers, think about it. If that means manipulate people in any way for any kind of attention that they wouldn't otherwise give, then that would include all the getting all of the getting behaviors, wouldn't it? So clinging is really all of the getting behaviors, which is why I don't talk a whole lot about clinging. It's all of them. So what I suggest to people who are clinging to other people is that in the beginning, the most useful thing to do is to be quiet. Shut up. It's very difficult to cling with your mouth shut. We tell stories to entertain people. We lie to win other people's approval. We exaggerate our good qualities to win other people's approval. Um, we are overly grateful uh, to other people so that they will like us, so that they will do more things for us. Um, I suggest to people that they walk around for months with their mouths shut and that they not speak until they, well, actually for a good long while, with not speaking at all. But then after you, when you consider speaking, that you say, I'm not going to speak until I ask myself, why am I speaking? What is the purpose of this sentence? Am I trying to get something from this? I worked with a man recently who talked a lot. And you know, I said to him, you need to think about why you're speaking because you're constantly trying to impress people. You're trying to earn their affection. You're trying to earn them liking you. You're trying to earn their attention. You're, and the instant you do that, you can't feel loved by anybody. That's the problem. I don't care if you're doing it, but it's killing you. Now, see, this wouldn't be the case with everybody. With somebody who's this would be just for people who cling. Now, with somebody who's frightened and who's constantly protecting themselves to earn safety, you would recommend to that person that they speak more often. So 
You don't give the same advice to everybody. Clingers, you'd recommend that they keep their mouths closed. Don't say a word and see what comes to them with their mouths closed. It really turns their world upside down. Another way that people cling is with service. People are, some people are constantly doing little favors for people. It never stops. They're always wrapping little presents and always making little CDs for people and wrapping little books and making little pictures and little collages and sending little cute things on the internet and little songs and little stuff. They're always doing little favors for people and why are they doing it? They're doing it so people will like them. Now, am I making fun of service? Am I making fun of people doing nice things for people? No, I'm not. What I'm saying is that for some people it becomes an absolute addiction and they can't stop it and they do it so that people will like them. I talked to a lady one day in a real love meeting who was, I don't know, 65 years old probably. And the group said to me, well, we have one example here of a lady who's never read real love, and, she, and yet she's a perfect example of unconditional love. <clears throat> and I took one look at her face and said, no, she's not. One look. And she looked at me with this look of, like, embarrassment and yet relief. It was like, hallelujah, somebody has finally seen through my lie it's because she was angry. I asked her one question. I said, how's your relationship with your husband? She said, well, he doesn't like it very much that I'm always out doing things for people. I said, that wasn't my question. How's your relationship with your husband? She said, we hardly ever speak. People who are genuinely, unconditionally loving don't go out and serve other people and are happy doing great things for people and entertaining other people and winning imitation love and then go home and have a hateful relationship with their spouse. They don't. Um, after just a few minutes of talking to her, she finally said, I am sick to death of going out and doing things for people and not getting anything in return. She's sick of it. So it turns out she's really just a clinger. And she clings by going out and earning other people's attention through service. So what I suggested to her was, you don't do one nice thing, nothing, zero, not one act of service for anybody for 30 days and see how it changes your life. She said it was freedom. It was like being let out of chains. So the response to your, you know, to your question is, for each clinger, it's different. Uh, Everybody does it a different way to, to get free of clinging. Let me remind you that uh, we've got the seminar coming up in Phoenix in um, August 2nd and 3rd and uh, about parenting and about leadership. And I strongly suggest that, uh, that you come. It's going to be really wonderful and that you recommend to those who uh, you know who would benefit from such an experience which should be even the planet um, to make arrangements to come to Phoenix even though it's going to be hotter than the surface of the sun uh, August 2nd 3rd and uh, all the information will be on the uh, website and we look forward to seeing you there um, and we also look forward to seeing you uh, next Tuesday. So send me your uh, emails and questions to greg at reallove.com. And we'll see you in Phoenix uh, next month. Till then, we love you tons. See you then. Bye.